this parenthesis uh, on both shares, it's not parenthesis that it is. It's a very important filmmaker, although less famous than Barkage and Um uh, Some of his interviews, very interesting. I don't know where you find them in English. They were translated in some very good book in France. Uh, very unusual for the French to do such books. <laughs> uh, and um, it's a conversation with the French uh, art historian called Jean-Claude Levenstein, who, who knew him and went to, to meet him several times in New York, and who was smart enough not to expect any particular uh, type of discourse uh, from Chavitz, as opposed to the orderly cross approach. And he was just asking all kinds of naive questions, apparently naive questions, but very, very accurate, in fact, about how he was working and why he was working in such, in such ways. And uh, Charit's answers are, are very nuanced, nuanced, have very nu many nuances uh, that are, I think, uh, symptomatic of the paradoxes of, of uh, the, the aesthetics of experimental film. So first he's talking in formal ways, of in formal terms, of uh, the work he's doing with time uh, and, and uh, time lapses and proportions and durations of shots. Mm -hmm. And he said that any temporal sequence can be compressed, de dilated, mm -hmm. extended, dilated, dilated etc. Mm -hmm. And that he likes to try different speed accelerates, slowing down, and mm. see how he reacts as a, as a viewer to his own work. And then he goes on explaining how he works with the very you know, uh, archaic for us material of the optical uh, tireuse and, uh, and the bon titre for, for uh, filming of images, etc. And this is what he says. One example, he cuts uh, a sequence in, in small, short and small parts, many, many small parts. You see uh, a chair falling and it's separated in small little moments like that, almost like a flickering effect already. And he's, he said, I suppose you could say that I dilated the natural uh, duration, but my way of seeing these things is that each step of the process had to be announced by the rhythms of colors. It's as if you said, this is a piece of this event, and this is its pulsatory meaning. Uh, as if you could extract an inner rhythm or pulsatory, like a cardiac rhythm out of an event. Of an event. So this is still all very formalistic. In, in its approach. <coughs> so it means that I could activate and comment on each segment of a particular event. And I'm thinking of one of Van Gogh's self-portraits. He writes that he wanted color to signify something about what the subject felt. That is, the color would express some of the, the subject's emotions. And he could do that in painting with a, re a certain relationship between the figure and the background. In film, I do it first showing the figure and then a segment, temporal segment, of pulsating colors, which is or acts as a background for the figure. So that this, the following step is to show the figure in motion itself, and then another, another set of uh, pulsations of pure color. So that this pulsating color that appears beneath, behind the figure, or after the figure, is a, uh, uh, how do you say, is um, emotional commentary on the, the, the figure itself. So that the color is used just as Van Gogh used it in, in his example, not as a, just an abstract and general you know, uh, component of, of the image, 
but as a emotionally charged uh, element that expresses what is in the figure but not obvious there. So it's then it goes into the language of expression, which is completely different, but is uh, for him compatible with the language of pure formal uh, analysis. And then in another in another moment of I believe the same interview, or yeah, it's still the same interview. He goes on to explain what he calls levels of representation, right? Uh, well, it's, it's quite simple. It means, uh, you can represent something that you see in the real world. You can represent the image of this thing. You can represent an image of an image, etc. And, and code and, and, and uh, in, in a more indirect ways. And he says that he's surprised. Uh, uh, he's surprised at how uh, younger generation persons he's discussing films with have no problems going from one level to the other because they're so used to be, you know, uh, uh, he said, to, to receive uh, constant uh, stimulations from audiovisual uh, material, publicity, etc., than to consider something both as a real object and as an image, or even as an image of an image, is no problem. At, it's not a problem for, me, for them. It's easy to go from one to the other. Whereas for him, he says, it was he's a generation that discovered television, saw television coming in the homes, and he, he was still uh, very very sensitive to the different levels of artificial uh, artificiality in the images, image of a real thing or image of an image or, or fake uh, simulated uh, things. And he goes on saying that the, the flickers for him as when he started to use, because he uses, on, on top of the flickers, he uses not so much shots that he took himself, but uh, shots of printed images, mm. like from catalogs, mm -hmm. objects, or from the press. So they're very flat, they're really like a Warhol uh, use of, of uh, you know, reproductive um, photographed yeah. photos or enlarged photos. You, you can almost see the, 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 um, you said the grid. Right, the DP. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he uses them as uh, fixed images. And the animation go comes from the, the change in the angle and also the change from negative to positive very often and from the color flicker that, that is added to it. So about that, he says that the flicker themselves, suddenly he, he calls them and he, he speaks uh, of them in different terms. Um, the pure sequential colors, I think, these films of pure sequential colors, I think, are in part films about anguish, about my anguish. Outside their interest for the realities of perception, so analytical interest, you could say, the um, is so is levels, but like when you enter a place, steps, 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 yeah. sages, sages, or steps of perception, and the possibility to create temporal <coughs> chords of color. Those are, for most of them, projections of internal feelings. When I do films on, 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 on celluloid uh, stripes, this reality is exterior to me. Color also is an exterior reality, of course. But I see the pure color films, his own, not so much as representations of things in the world, but as representation of internal states, psychological, emotional, and intellectual. When I start doing a film about something, whether it is an apple, a piece of celery, or a stripe, or, or a scratch, I go, I, I, yeah, I go to, uh, I reach a perception of the world that is more objective. I walk <coughs> outside and I'm curious of the nature of the world surrounding me. I re-photograph in real time, and I'm in the real world, so to speak. 
But when I make films of true color, so he distinguishes two kinds of things, right? Uh, I put together the colors in my mind. I make a score, like a musical score. And this is uh, done for the most part uh, in the moment of shooting. Nothing happens in real time. So it's like writing music, right? Write a symphony and to write two seconds of a symphony of a large orchestra in like two weeks. So it's usually something like that. So nothing happens in real time. It's an architecture constructed in time. And this is uh, this has to do with the difference between an external perspective and an internal perspective. Sometimes I'm more interested in my inner dynamics, sometimes more uh, uh, by the objects and the events outside me. So, to come back to this question of the levels of representation that I mentioned earlier, is uh, different levels of, of quotation of image within an image, I think that I have an attitude more objective when I work with the pure color films, more analytical. Maybe. And when I put together several levels of signification, of, of meaning, I wish to present a proposition concerning the relationship between the things, rather than express an internal feel. So you have two uh, poles, so to speak, two, two <coughs> directions. One would be more objective and analytical, and, and uh, pertain to perception, uh, the, the, the mechanism of, of cinema, and the levels of representation, and even the political, ideological um, content and connotation of the images. And this is definitely an important part of his work. Then on the other hand, you have what he calls the pure color films, or the pure color element in films, because it can be added by superimposition. And there, he seems to express in a very inarticulate, but in a very articulate way, inarticulate uh, inner feelings, uh, emotions, fears, etc. Maybe there is another quote uh, to confirm that. Well, as a symptom, you could say that, as an artist, because I mentioned earlier, that maybe only to you, that uh, Sharitz was also a uh, painter and sculptor, especially at the end of, of his career, but he, all along he was doing some painting and some sculpture. And uh, uh, speaking of, of painting and sculpture and his influences, this is what he says. If I hadn't been interested in art when I was a teenager, I would probably have become a juvenile delinquent. Mm -hmm. That's another story. I played music then, classical music, and I continued to, to do uh, illegal activities. Uh, when I was studying in Denver and discovering the beatniks and doing eight millimeters films with a friend of mine, Dickie Lucero. Mm -hmm. My first hero was Le Greco. Now it is Goya, Munch, Enzo, The Last Monet, Fragonard, Ernst, Duchamp, Pollock, and many others like uh, Wreckage. But the first ones are interesting because they're really very expressionist in a large sense artists like Goya, Munch, Enzo. They are not formalist, you know, they're not Kandinsky or and his work should be, I think, viewed in this perspective, uh, outside the, the, the narrow uh, purist, modernist uh, vision of uh, art history, because it's both formalist and express expressionist. Mm -hmm. And he says the same of Bryce Marden, for instance, He's, you know, a great painter, but for him it's not only, you know, abstract, rigorous painter. So this seems a bit uh, contradictory, not very coherent, mm -hmm. and I think it all comes to the same um, double imperative, so to speak, of um, how can 
mathematical uh, expression and analysis or of <coughs> subjective lyricism and um, universal, uh, universally uh, intelligible uh, meaning that we found also in, in Brackage uh, work and, and, and text. <laughs> so enough about this, this, this uh, ambiguity or, or contradiction. Uh, individual imagery, universal meaning, literal uh, presence of, of the outside world or the inside world, and symbolic use of images as you know, signifying completely different things than, than the ones you actually see. Uh, then a third antinomy would be, and this allows us also to, to have a quick look at the other trend, completely different trend in experimental film, it would be the antinomy of, um, the, or, or the, the, the double imperative of uh, recording and fabricating or, 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 or uh, uh, creating. Cinema, of course, is linked to the mechanical arts of reproduction, mechanical reproduction, like photography and the recording. Well, we discussed that for a long time. So, recording is obvious uh, as, a, as a fundamental you know, gesture for cinema. But what about fabricating, creating the images, producing them just as a painter or sculptor <coughs> does? This was from the start, a possibility that was explored by some avant-garde uh, experimental filmmakers and even by people like Brackage, as we saw. <coughs> this was supposed to be excluded from the, the orthodox uh, experimental tradition as, as stated by Maya Deren, as I mentioned earlier, but the fact is that it was not uh, excluded and many of these artists used direct, you know, uh, plastic art. <laughs> and you can wonder not only at the, the, the legitimacy of this uh, separation, when Maya Dern says that cinema is only when you record the thing from the real world, but as even its logical uh, possibility. I mean, there is something if you look at the matter closely in the experimental practice, not in the classical realistic practice, but in the experimental practice, I would like to suggest that such a distinction is actually impossible, or, or you cannot keep it uh, uh, to the end when you look at, 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 at the, the essence of the matter, that is, the kind of imagery that is produced in experimental. This difference between production of an image Arts are out of nothing, and recording of an image no longer um, uh, works. Um, if you look at it uh, really closely, why? <laughs> because, as we saw in the Brackage example, if the object, the outside real object in question, is not a thing, you know, like a being, I say I film a chair, I film a boy, I film a wall, but it's rather a fragment of vision that can be in your eye without being outside completely of your eye, that is something that is uh, linked to the act of seeing in such a way that it cannot be separated from the act of seeing or the act of imagining seeing in the mind or seeing with your eyes closed. So that if the object is in this sense hypnagogic, that is suscitated also by some stimulation of your system, your nervous and, and optical system, such as the phosphene, I still don't know the English terms, you know, these things that you get when you press your eyes, or such as hallucinations, drug-induced uh, visions, uh, whatever, mirage, <coughs> you know, ghosts, uh, things that are in between perception and imagination, such objects are not, strictly speaking, outside physical realities. 
and they cannot be, strictly speaking, differentiated from objects that would be created by pure you know, color and uh, matter in a completely um, autonomous artistic activity, such as painting. So the difference doesn't really hold on this point, uh, if, if that is the, the, the purpose. If the purpose is not you know, documenting outside reality, such as everyone sees it, but documenting the real workings of vision and inner vision and imagination, such as Berkic says when he says, I want to show the untrained eye and the untutored vision. The untutored vision is never only outside. It's both outside and inside. And it's the same thing that, that Charitz refers to when he says, I think these color changes refer to inner states. But inner states are not things that can, you can hold and you can, you can analyze as objects or as beings. They're produced, they're events, they're something that happened in your mind, but they're not objects. And something that happened in your mind, that are produced in your mind, are not different than images you want to paint, or things you want to write, or things you want to create out of nothing, through imagination. So the, this, the, the whole paradox here revolves around the role of imagination. Is imagination just taking from reality and, and prolonging reality? Or is it also creating things that have absolutely no real basis and are self-induced in your brain? And obviously this, this uh, undecidable limit is consciously perceived by people like Brackage himself. Why? <coughs> Because he started saying, I'm doing eye films. There is film that are concerned with vision. The actual vision, not the vision the way you have trained it, but the vision that an infant would, would have, for instance. But after a while, he said, after the eye films I tried to make, I'm now interested in doing brain films. What is the difference between an eye film and a brain film? Formally, there is no difference. Uh, they look the same, more or less. But the intention is very different because a brain film does not pretend that what it shows is really seen by anyone in any circumstance. The brain film pretends or wants to show how the brain functions with images. So it can be only metaphorical. And again, Brackage stumbles, but he knows it, on the question of metaphor and symbolism. If you're not showing the actual thing, then you can only do a metaphorical evocation or a symbolical evocation of what you're, what you're referring to. That is, the works of imagination, the works of the brain. You won't do, he's not doing endo endoscopic you know, surgery mm -hmm. to show uh, how the brain really acts. He's doing artistic evocation of what the brain would be like. Right? So this is only a metaphor or an imagery. And when it's no longer vision, there is no adherence anymore between the, the, the natural activity and the film you see. It's only a representation, but an indirect representation of something that you cannot see, that you cannot reach, and certainly not say. That is, the brain activity is probably the most complex and the richest object of science for the next few centuries. So it's not Brackage who will suddenly say, oh, I know how the brain functions, I will show it to you. He can only evoke it, you know, approach it through visions that are half arbitrary, half symbolical, mm, that evoke certain things that speak to you in different ways, but not in this scientific, objective way, or certainly not in a realistic way. So when you go from the eye film to the brain film as Brackage, does, you in fact go from an idea of cinema as capturing things from reality, like this trophy I, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, capturing with mechanical reproduction some of the real things, to another idea of cinema that is very different, which is a creation with no real basis, no material basis outside but a creation like a painting, like a sculpture, like a poem, that could evoke some real phenomenon, and in this case, internal phenomenon, not external phenomenon. 
So then, again, the difference between the artifact fabricated image and the recorded image no longer is no longer meaningful. It's not even possible to say this image is uh, a, re a recording of something happening that really happened, you know, this day, this very day, when this child was born, he put the camera on, and, and, and mm -hmm. the light of the day was like that, and that's what we see. And to differentiate such an image from an image that you would have done with paint, you know, on a pure, neutral, transparent, plus uh, cellular film. Even though the difference materially exists, philosophically, or, or conceptually, when you watch the film, it doesn't matter anymore. It has no meaning. Because both images, the one that is recorded and used, like in the film we saw about birth, and the one that is painted directly on film, both images refer not to outside reality, but to self-induced, quasi-hallucinatory uh, imagery, internal imagery. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether they were completely invented or they were taken in part from reality. And if this difference doesn't hold, then the whole aesthetics of experimental film <coughs> as real cinema based on recording of reality, it, it, it collapses. And it did collapse. I mean, the, the strict uh, idea of experimental film, as Maya Deren announced, and she's like the founding mother of the tradition, was not really applied and respected by the disciples. Uh, and early 60s, even in the, in the 50s, some of them did films with uh, animation, with drawing, with <laughs> photographs, with hand painted films, etc., etc. And uh, so that the whole direct film tradition, very small, very underground tradition, uh, two or three people in the world would do that, but still, it existed since, since the late 30s with Len Lai. Uh, I gave you a text that you won't have time to comment on, but if you read it, you'll see how smart and, and, and uh, precise uh, Len Lai was in his writing about the, this uh, conception of cinema as direct cinema, as plastic art of movement. Well, this trend of uh, direct film continued and was revived, actually, in the 60s very strongly among experimental filmmakers, such as, well, we saw what Rakic did with it, but we saw, it was not, we didn't see, but I mentioned Sharitz, how he did it, but uh, there are people like Harry Smith, who did many, many films, hand-painted films, of a completely different aspect than the Rakic films. Uh, Harry Smith, uh, I mentioned Van der Beek, who did collage films, quite, quite extraordinary animation from uh, cuts, uh, cut images, and, and so on. And there were uh, many others that, in this way, uh, continued and prolonged what had been uh, attempted in the 30s by people like Fischinger and, and, uh, and even uh, Fernand Léger, for instance, or even Duchamp, who, who did films that were closer to direct film Although it's not a direct film, film, but it's closer to a direct film than than to any other recording film. Uh, if you know the famous anemic cinema film by Duchamp, the words and there's no depth. Uh, it could be, it wouldn't be very different if he had directly done it on a bounty like with animation. It's flat, and you have these moving geometrical spirals, so it really looks pretty much like. Uh, some of the films of uh, Fischinger, for instance. Fischinger, you know, uh, was actually filming uh, drawings and paintings that he pasted on the walls. It's a very simple technique, you know, but uh, a lot of work, and he did it very precisely. He, he would, you know, do these, these um, absolutely homogeneous uh, surfaces of color. You can see no difference. It's really like print, but it's handmade. On, on, you know, just drawing, average drawing paper. So he would paste them on the wall and one by one photograph them and then do the, the editing. So um, this then 
was revived in the 60s and with no real uh, conflict or even limit uh, with the um, classically recorded images of experiment. So they could coexist and blend and you could have hybrids like some br brackage films or others where you had recorded images and direct intervention on the film uh, on top of it. <coughs> so this antinomy of recording and fabrication is uh, is actually a fallacy. I mean, it's, it's the opposition was necessary to, to to conceive of a general idea of experimental cinema, but it couldn't hold for long, and it didn't. So I encourage you to look at the Len Lai text that I won't comment on, but very very interesting text. Also, it's it's um, it's a text that he wrote with a very important. Uh, poet at the time, Laura Riding, it's a pseudonym Laura Riding. And, um, well, this is something I didn't comment on, but there was a constant exchange between poets and, and filmmakers in these uh, uh, traditions, both in the 30s, 20s. Uh, Man Ray, one of the first of Man Ray's film was a, a kind of a filming of a poem, if you could say that, uh, by, by this nose. Then Brackage, I told you, he was himself kind of a poet, or he tried, he started as, as such, and he, he, he uh, talked about art a lot with other poets of his time. And Len Lai, the same. When he was in England, he was in the avant-garde uh, literary circles. And, uh, exchanging ideas and forms, or ideas of forms, with the writers and the poets. So, yes. No, no. But, uh, just to go back uh, to experimental cinema dying, uh, this is what you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. the, the death of, uh, in a way, it led to the death of experimental cinema. Yes. Okay. I didn't say it, but uh, <laughs> not wrong. It collapsed. Yes. Um, would you say that experimental cinema died, but experimental film survived? Mm -hmm. And that the cinema experience as a format contributed to this, rather than the film as monitor experience? As monitor experience? Yeah, yeah. Monitor experience. like monitor. Oh, you you mean? Uh, I'm talking about the, about the projection. Yeah, uh, the experience of the cinema as a cinema. Right. Projection right. Audience, yes. large audience. Yes. Rather than the experience of the monitor format as more individual. This would be the surviving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. I've never thought of that in these terms. Uh, it's true that projecting something that is not celluloid film is not as justified in a way because you don't have the same you know, physical and chemical uh, uh, phenomenon in the film. But I think, I'm heading towards some conclusion of this kind, but uh, I'm not quite there, there yet because I, I think that if it's, this tradition is in a way dead or over, it's not only and probably not mostly because of the conceptual and philosophical contradictions that it, that it uh, uh, contained, but it's, it's due to major, although sometimes discrete, changes in the techniques. Mm. And not only the techniques, but the philosophical meaning of these techniques. So I agree with you in that sense that the technicality of it is very important. And that perhaps screen, individual screen versus collective projection is, is, is one uh, important difference. <coughs> but uh, more than that, I think the, the physical, uh, the physical uh, process of recording images has changed radically. And it changed not only the, the practice that we can have, but it changes the relationship that we have with these images and the way we relate to the, the outside world through these images. 
And that's probably why uh, the experimental tradition cannot go on uh, as such with such a different uh, context, within such a different context. And then there's another change that uh, I will tomorrow hopefully um, try to discuss, uh, which is a change in the quantity and the rhythm of uh, moving images that uh, we live with. Mm. I think that when, when, when you make films in a culture where you go to a cinema to see a film and then you don't see films for a week or two or just a little bit of television and it's this kind of ceremony, there is a solemnity in your relationship to the image, uh, then the kind of work you can do and the kind of effect you can obtain is very different than in a culture where as now, we're constantly watching naked images on all kinds of screens and all kinds of uh, uh, sizes and, and scales, etc. So, yeah, but probably there's still other reasons, historical reasons that I'm not aware of that go uh, along with what you said. But certainly, I don't think that experimental with film, experimenting with moving images, film is not the right word because we don't have film in the anymore. I don't think that this is uh, either impossible or useless, or, or, or that it's uh, you know an only a historical historical thing. On the contrary, I think it's you know, all kinds of uh, of experimentation will proliferate and already do with the moving image. But they would certainly not be uh, uh, they, they could they couldn't be unified. Uh, within an aesthetic project as ambitious and as difficult also as the experimental uh, tradition of the, the post-war America, for instance. And I think it's very perceptible uh, by students in art schools, for instance, that they, they, but maybe we should discuss that tomorrow when I'm over with all the history, <laughs> that uh, with the, uh, the way they use uh, uh, the cameras and recording of images is not at all linked to cinema mm. very often. Yeah, yeah. Usual artists that work explicitly mm. with cinema like this is a being, for example. Or right, but then it's a very strong um, statement mm. to go back to these techniques and it's a quotation of mm. the past and it's like, you know, I don't know, it's like doing handmade uh, computers, it's, you know, this kind of thing, right? Uh, uh, I, I don't say that it's not legitimate or not justified, but it's extremely artificial, mm -hmm. right? So that you can argue, you can have all kinds of arguments. You can say, of course, and it's true, that the kind of, of light and colors that you get with 16 millimeters, you never get with something else, that's true. But on the other hand, I'm not so sure about that. It's true that the technique is, well, I don't know how to put that. Like with the music uh, techniques, for instance, you have acoustic instruments, right? And then you have uh, first generation uh, amplifiers mm -hmm. and effects, and, you know, reverbs, and etc. And then you have everything that follows. But when you get to the digital era where everything is on the computer, you can feed the acoustic instrument into the computer. So that you, you can have a fake acoustic sound, which is quite convincing. And you can even have like the old, you know, uh, amplifiers with lamps reproduced digitally. So that ideally a new technique should be able to integrate the older techniques and not erase them. And I'm sure that with, well, we're just at the beginning with the HD uh, yeah. uh, film, but I'm sure that you will get something like that. And that pretty soon, if you want to have the 16 millimeter effect and the brain and stuff, you will have these, you know, yeah. these, these uh, uh, plugins <laughs> and it will work. Yeah. So I think it's an optimistic thing. You should be optimistic about that, but nothing is lost. And, and you can always integrate if you want. Uh, now people who did uh, you know rap music at first with only records, they all play acoustic instruments. You know, that's a fashionable thing. And 
go back to the activity. But it's not incompatible. You can feed the machine with the old machines. Yes. Uh, I, um, I remember Sam Brackage in an interview saying that video, the light from a video projector, it's dead light. Uh -huh. And uh, be, I mean, because it works differently physiologically. Um, and uh, then, you know, the light of a projector or, or yes. a film projector. So no matter how, how you replicate it to look like that, it's still dead. So in a sense, experimental film is dead, but yeah. only when it's shown on a video projector. It's alive if you're showing it on a film projector. It's like vinyl and, and CD. Yes, but again, I understand the argument, <laughs> but I think it's not entirely true. If you really want to, to keep the quality, it can be very expensive, like you do, you know, you do digital film with single 35 millimeter frames, like real yeah. frames, and you know, it's very expensive, and it takes forever. But you can do it. And the projector problem, I understand, but it's it's a problem for the mass, the, 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 you know, the average material that everyone has that is very limited, of course. But if you want to get like this, like Baroque music. You know, they find the ancient instruments and they they pretend, they think that they play the way it was played at Bicep. It's not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> no way to know. But at least they, they can try, you know. And I know, and Brackage also said that uh, television well, did not exist for him as a medium and could never work on any DVD or any uh, individual screen for a very simple, basic reason. It's that when you show a film, in a, in a cinema, the film has the colors, and the colors you want, you have put on the cellular, and they can't change it. Whereas when you have your own screen, you do the, yeah. the color. You decide what the color of the film is. That's true. But if you want to have the real color as it was, well, you do research, and you know, you can reconstitute it. Right, but the, I'm just saying that the lamp and everything is really different, and no matter how you try to duplicate it with digital techniques, it's still a different light, and it affects you differently physiologically. That's true. You know, and that's the... Yeah. That's true, but should we regret that? that? I'm not sure, because you could say the same of uh, Rembrandt's paintings, you know. Yeah. They were probably lighter at the time, you know. <laughs> the colors changed. Too bad, you know, but yeah. it's, even, it's still better than not having them. But were you... When you were talking about techniques, were you, I mean, you weren't just <coughs> meaning the actual technology of the technique, because you, you said well, that. Well, yes, were, I was, I okay. was, because I was thinking, but then I, well, I wanted to save that for the last Next. remarks I made, but it's okay, it doesn't matter. I was thinking of the fact that uh, recording an image by coding and coding it digitally, it's like, it's encoding. It's not at all the same, not only in its effect, but conceptually. It's not, it's not, it's essentially different than recording an image by having light chemically acting on a, on a material surface. It's not at all the same process. Because in one case, the, 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 old, the, the old technique of you know, light impressing, uh, impression, impression in, in this case, the, the impression itself is a physical, almost natural phenomenon. You know, we see how the light acts on, on the film, and you can play with that. In the other case, it's the model is not <coughs> physical contact, and actually the model is computation. And that is calculation, code, and coding. <coughs> and coding can never pretend to have the same physical relationship with, with, with the, 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 the object as uh, light reflection has, I think. So even if the, the image at the end looks exactly the same, it's not the same act, it's not the same uh, right. creative um, phenomenon, uh, whether you have, whether you submit it to light and you let light, you know, strike on something or you decipher the, the color and light information and transfer it in, in, into, you know, uh, bits, uh, uh, zeros and ones. Isn't that the same as, you, as the argument for, for uh, um, 
your tube amplifiers in a digital process. Yeah. It's, it's still, it's not the same physical. Right. Uh, but, but it's faked enough that it's convincing. Same with exactly. everything we do digitally. We can fake it enough that you wouldn't know the difference. But there are things. Yeah, but some of those physical things that you say you right. can do on celluloid, you can do those same things in After Effects, even though you don't, you know, drop the, you know, the, the, the acid right on the, on the celluloid. But there's new, I, I've experimented this myself, there, there's, because of the computation in digital, there's also problems, you know, as far as the universality of the di different digital cameras and the technology. Mm -hmm. And so some of the problems that people don't like, I, I mean, I've played with, uh, th there's things that you can do with the camera that other cameras can't do. Of course, and yeah. and, and uh, the, the, the different the, codecs. And right, the different codecs and, and yeah. the, the different timing and things. And yeah, things that people don't want, but you could actually yeah uh, do experimental type things with. Sure, sure. You can, but you have to create your own tools. It's just right. the same. You know, at the time, the, the celluloid film was not intended to be treated as as the pictural right. surface and. and uh, all these uh, inventions were also bricolage, anyway, you know, improvising with the, with the tools that you got. And certainly with computers, uh, it's, it's an open door to all kinds of you know, improvised new tools. So if we only have 10 more minutes, and I'll just uh, conclude this uh, list of paradoxes in experimental tradition, but the last one that is actually another form of something you have seen, which is an antinomy between the sensitive or sensorial um, uh, um, nature of, of what is supposed to be an experimental film and the cerebral uh, uh, nature of some of its contents as well, like the difference between eye films and brain films for, for brackets. You could extend that to other uh, works and other um, authors in the sense that the sensorial is supposed to guarantee you, to, to, to guarantee a certain uh, naturalness and the, the, the truthfulness of passivity. You, you, you record what you see, what you feel, and there is no manipulation if it's purely sensitive sense data. You know, if you, 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 you want to be on the strict level of perception as it works. So, in a way, this is uh, an argument for the validity and uh, the, the pertinence of experimental film, if you say, Experimental film show you how the eye and the perception actually works. Hmm. And even now you have very good cinematographers who do this kind of thing like, um, I should never look for names because when I look for names I don't find it. But there's uh, one American uh, very brilliant filmmaker who shows his film now only through the net. and. Um, and it will come back to me. And he films things a little like Brackage could have done, but the style is very different. Very banal and uh, you know common objects like um, water, a pond, uh, plants, a cat, you know, uh, ordinary creatures of everyday life. But he films them and edits them in such a way that you have the impression of of seeing the object and the image create themselves in front of you mm -hmm. out of a blur or, or kind of a uh, um, moving uh, um, outlines that get more precise and then move again and escape and go out of focus or out of the frame and back. And so it's kind of a dance of perception that really doesn't conjure any symbolic meaning and you don't need at all to think of whatever this means. You just are you marvel at the simple richness of perception that it gives. Uh,
just as when you see a, a, you know, a film made in holiday by someone like a, an amateur, sometimes you have marvelous shots, some extremely beautiful things appear and very precise. And you don't care if it means anything or if it's intent, it, it has any intention, it doesn't matter. It's just the image in itself it gives you a very rich perception and sense of what is shown. And this is uh, this kind of work I'm referring to. So this would be then the sensitive or sensorial uh, purpose of some experimental film. And, uh, I swear I will remember his name, at least for, for tomorrow. Uh, you can buy this film, it's like a DVD. Quite expensive because you, you buy also the right to show them, but That's it's worth it. Yeah. And you can probably see some of them. <coughs> so this, this uh, purpose is clear and simple enough. But then what if you cannot strictly distinguish it from the works of intelligence, associative thinking, imagination, the whole brain uh, film aspect, which then um, um, introduces into the simple perception something that is not pure perception, but that is uh, association, imagination, meaning, instruction, um, and then you cannot simply say I'm just watching what's there I'm just watching the pure appearance and phenomenal uh, existence of visual thing you're also intervening you're also interpreting it and changing it by your vision and this we have seen is, is happening constantly like in, in films like Brackage's films or, or others and in more general perspective it means that this difference itself is not at all secure, it's not at all a very strong uh, uh, difference between the pure sense data and the intellectual elaboration and on the uh, philosophical level it's easy to show that pure sense data don't, simply don't exist uh, mm. the sense data is always informed uh, by, by thinking by habit culture, by uh, you know, what you know about things. You cannot do what Brackage pretends to do, go back to the infancy of vision. It's, it's just not possible. So that the distinction between pure vision and interpretation, let's call it, uh, visual interpretation, is not a real difference. It's not a real limit. And therefore, the difference between, for instance, improvisation, passive improvisation, you know, being open to what perception actually gives you without intervening or interpreting. The difference between this activity and calculation and manipulation of the image is also impossible to establish. Mm. And even when Brackage is running, you know, in the woods with his camera mm -hmm. and filming, you know, little drops of water, um, not knowing what he's going to do with it, uh, just improvising, he is in fact computing. He is already you know, composing something, and therefore what he gets is what <coughs> he wants to get, and what he films is what he, you know, he finds what he, what he was looking for, I think, and not uh, simply what is there, because what is there is not there. I mean, what is there is not um, um, accessible as such. To access what is there, you have to, to have a purpose, an aim, focus, and, and, and go for something. So that intelligence, composition, calculation is always, in a way or another, present in the, the, the most innocent act of vision, and therefore uh, justifying experimental film by the need to come back to this primary process of perception is actually uh, a fallacy, although it's, it's a very you know, respectable and, and admirable, uh, even in a way. It's a little like what Freud called the processus primaire, I don't know if you can translate that in English. He says that dreams, and dreams are a good example, maybe I think it's too late, 
No, no, they still have five minutes. The dreams are a good example for that because they were a model for many of the films we saw and the associative logic of dreams. But what is a dream? If you if you try to see really what the, the dream itself is, outside and before the account you can give, the narrative you can give when you wake up to someone and say, I dream this and this and that, what the actual dream is, is very elusive. It may be a quasi-nothing. You know, it may happen in one second, uh, and, the, and then you develop the whole So In the Freudian tradition, this is well known as the difference between the primary material of dream and what he calls secondary elaboration. Secondary elaboration is what makes it a sequence, a narration, and there is an appearance of logic, even though it's strange logic. There is a certain coherency, uh, the same characters, and the same etc. Et but the secondary elaboration in, uh, for Freud is a complete invention. He said it's something that is suscitated by the waking life when you're awake and your relationship with the person you're talking to and the associations that what comes from the dream creates in your mind so that you make it up as you know as you tell it. You're not aware of that. You think you remember, but you don't remember. You actually make up a story from this obscure and strange material that you don't really access as such. So what is this material? Then this is a metaphysical question. You know, it's, it's as if asking, you know, that is a tree in a wood that no one ever sees exist? Does it exist or not? You know, if no one is there to see it, where well, the material of your of your dream, no one can see it, not even yourself. So is it even something? What is it? So here you you have two ways of of trying with. Of, of dealing with such a, a, a mystery. One is to say, well, uh, we'll never know about it, so we shouldn't even you know, speculate. You know, what happens when your brain does not function logically, not chronologically, uh, that a thing can be several things, that a, an, a, an image can be other than what it seems, or no image at all, but just something that creates it, well, then it's absolutely useless to try to investigate such material, if it exists. But the second option is to imagine a process of its own that would be completely different from the secondary elaboration and opposed to it. And that's what is called in the psychoanalytic tradition, and it's a very problematic concept, the primary process. Primary process is what would be happening in your mind when you're actually dreaming, for instance, or when you're having conscious desires, what is happening consciously, and that doesn't become conscious. And so how can you qualify such a thing that you never see, you never touch, you never know? Well, you qualify it negatively, like in apophatic theology. You cannot say what it is, but you can say everything that it is not. So you will say, it is not chronological. It doesn't know the difference between before and after. It's not logical, so it doesn't know the principle of contradiction. One thing can be its opposite. And this is common to all unconscious, you know, contents. The unconscious doesn't know contradiction. Okay. Uh, so there's no temporality, there's no logic, and it's a flow of thoughts, signs, images, untamed, exactly as Brackage said, untutored, and we can only know that it's not, you know, what we know, but it exists, and, and we should try to go back and to, to, to access this because this is a true functioning of the, of the mind. And artists, for instance, should try to, to stimulate this primary process uh, before logic, before articulation. And they can do it, they cannot speak, they cannot express it by words, but they can express it by you know, color, movement, whatever. And so you can have a whole aesthetics based on this hypothetical 
uh, activity of the unconscious mind. And maybe, you know, uh, artistic movements such as fluxes, for instance, or, you know, uh, spontaneous, chaotic, you know, uh, 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 type of works like, I don't know, the Viennese actionists who want to revive, you know, basic pulsions of Dionysiac desires and, and irrational culture. It's something like that. They suppose that there is another level uh, in, in, in everyone's mind that should be activated. But no one knows of the actuality of, of, of this so-called primary process. It's, it may be just a belief, just as a religious belief. You know. And uh, you will never have a direct proof of its existence. So this is something that you can object to all these aesthetic claims that uh, you know, we are digging deeper and we are going to dig so deep that, that it won't make sense and it's not logic, but that's precisely the, the, the proof that it's you know, uh, true in, in a deeper sense and more essential than all the articulate logical forms that you can find. And this is something that can be objected to some of, of experimental film practices, not all, but uh, at least some of them. That is, there is no real separation between the rational improvisation and the elaboration of intelligence and calculations in language. This is a mythical uh, uh, difference ideological one. But then, and then I'm, I'm, I'm through uh, for today, there is something common to all these difficult uh, coexisting and opposing uh, claims. There is something common to all of them, uh, something that makes them similar to a very traditional uh, way of thinking thinking about art and language as well as about um, um, religious uh, matters and so the contradiction between an individual you know utterance and universal meaning between a very literal presence of the physical things and a very symbolical meaning attached to it, uh, between uh, the, the simple recording of reality and the fabrication and manipulation of, uh, of forms and, and uh, images, and finally between a purely sensitive sensorial experience like a primary uh, uh, process and an elaborate, you know, uh, posterior and artificial working you see that, well, there are really different versions of the same uh, opposition, but all of these contradicting um, theses or, or assumptions, you, you will find them together in uh, what I just evoked uh, this morning um, as the prophetic tradition, mm. the prophetic, uh, you know, call it, Prophetic experience, prophetic experience. In the prophetic experience, the, both sides of each of these contradictions is present and is as true as its opposite. Is the prophet is a, you know, uh, an individual, a now and particular individual, but he has access to a universal message uh, from God. And he is uh, uh, delivering a very simple and and concrete um, uh, text, so to speak. It's the word of God saying, you know, you shouldn't work on Saturday. Something like that. You know. But this meaning is also completely other. It's a symbolic, mystical uh, 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 sentence that has to be interpreted and maybe for generation because it's so rich in meaning. Then, it's uh, so literal and symbolic is, is of course uh, characteristic of the prophecy and then the prophet is also a poet and an artist and in a way the prophet can be interpreted very often is interpreted as an imposter 
because he makes things up. You know, he's delirium. He's de de delirious. Like with the mad, you know, uh, uh, people who, who can read the future. Yeah. And through his own imagination, that's the imagination is not something that creates lies, but rather his imagination is precisely what gives him access to the, the higher truth. And so the paradox of making things up versus finding the truth as such as it is, you know, in the words of God, is something that is present also in all uh, prophecies. Uh, prophecy is an, is an invention, poetical invention, as well as a received message. And this has been theorized in a very strong way by visionary people like uh, visionary thinkers and artists like William Blake. And uh, I, I gave you a text, a famous text, about the power of imagination, exactly what he says. In praise of the, the imagination, you have to say that imagination is not simply creating, you know, unreal and arbitrary lies, but imagination is a power that gives you access to things that you could never see without imagining, that you could never, you know, deduce uh, logically or rationally from, from what you know, and you need to dream, you need to have fantasies. And in dreams, higher truths appear, right? And a prophetic dream is a classical, of course, classical instance of that. So the Blade text, uh, I didn't comment on, but it's a short text, and well known text you can look at. As well as Wallace Stevens, I didn't comment on, but mm -hmm. if we have time tomorrow, we'll, we'll go into it. So this is characteristic of prophecy, as well as uh, all the rest of these um, conflicting. Uh, demands or conflicting claims um, of the very material, carnal, physical to the very spiritual and abstract. Prophecies are always both. You know, very material, you have a text, you know, it's written, and it's very concrete usually in its uh, um, um, uh, say commandments, but it's also uh, something that, that contains the highest, most uh, supernatural um, and mystical meanings that you can ever get in the, in the world, in the material world. So uh, I won't develop that much, but we'll see tomorrow.